Hey everyone, how's it going? Thanks so much for tuning in. Today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at this 1956 Ford Thunderbird. Before we get started, I'd like to extend a huge thanks to O'Reilly Auto Parts for supporting the channel. The next time you need to do some maintenance on your car or just start tackling some kind of DIY project, don't forget to check out O'Reilly. I've got a link to their website down in the description below. As with all of my reviews, I'm going to cover all of the ins and outs and take this thing on a thorough drive. There's a whole lot of stuff to cover, so without further ado, let's go ahead and start her up and let her run. Referred to by Ford as a personal car of distinction, the Thunderbird was originally inspired by bespoke roadsters of the 1930s and was the brand's first two-seat car since 1938. First launched in 1955, it was a revolutionary concept, yet it was constructed largely of existing components, making this the first step towards the evolution of the personal luxury car as a mass market segment in the United States. Despite being relatively lightweight for its day and having a standard V8 engine, the Thunderbird focused more on driver comfort than anything else and was not technically a direct competitor to the Corvette. At the time, it also seemed better suited to the American market. In fact, there were 16,155 Thunderbirds sold in 1955 versus 674 Corvettes. The first generation Thunderbird, produced through 1957, was the only generation to be offered exclusively as a two-seater, until Ford launched the retro-inspired eighth generation in 2002. The distinctive lines of the baby birds, as they're commonly referred to, set the style for all of the new 1956 Ford cars. The Thunderbird was as ruggedly built as it was dramatically styled. The body is a one-piece all-steel design with a full frame underneath. The steel structure around the windshield was welded into a single, extra-strong front body structure. Husky gussets and braces at the body's inside corners added rigidity, while new double-grip door latches added strength and security. New cowl side vents for 56, along with new door wind deflectors, helped increase body ventilation efficiency and supplement the twin front intake fresh air system. Each vent door is manually operated from inside the car, where bright metal louvers direct air to the driver and passenger. The long, low appearance comes from the clean-cut, straight-back fender lines, optional two-tone styling, and the new for 56 Continental-type outside spare tire mounting, which helped to significantly increase trunk space. There were nine exterior colors offered for 1956, plus a huge variety of two-tone options, in which the hard top would contrast with the rest of the body. This car is finished in colonial white. The massive rear bumper has a center section built around the metal spare tire cover. This section also incorporates the license plate mounting and light. The upper portion of this section extends back to serve as a unique extra strong bumper guard. The Continental kit extended the Thunderbird's overall length by 10 inches. The car rides on a 102-inch wheelbase and has an overall length of 185 inches. 
It's 70.3 inches wide and 52.4 inches tall when measured at the roof line. The dual exhaust ports are integrated into the wraparound area of the rear bumper towards the sides. Besides the easily removable standard fiberglass hard top, two optional tops were also available. The first was a new hard top that featured large circular quarter windows. It was a no-cost option and provided nearly 14% greater visibility to the sides of the car, essentially eliminating the blind spots of the standard top. A convertible type soft top was an extra cost option. It could be had in white vinyl or black cloth depending on the exterior color. The soft top stows neatly out of sight behind the seat. It's hand operated and for 56 features a 4 inch wider rear window along with an improved linkage system and new assist springs for easier operation. Rearward visibility improved by nearly 10% compared to the 55 model. All of the tops fasten firmly by means of two quick acting toggle clamps on the windshield header panel and four on the rear panel behind the seat. This car is also equipped with a two-piece vinyl cabin cover that zippers in the middle. There's snap fasteners around the perimeter of the cabin that secure the cover in place. It even has a little bump out for the steering wheel. It was a nice convenience feature just in case there was some unexpected rain, you could quickly get the cover in place and protect the interior from rain. Safety glass was used for the side windows as well as the windshield, and the entire Thunderbird body was sound and weather insulated for greater year-round comfort. This car in particular was originally sold new by Old Capital Motors Incorporated out of Kingston, New York on June 22, 1956. As far as I've been able to tell, it has every factory option that Ford offered for these cars in 1956. Aside from needing work on the rocker panels and rear quarters, the car is in wonderful shape for its age, a true time capsule. Base pricing for 56 models was around $3,000, give or take some. The original out-the-door price for this car was $4,650. For an added touch of fancy, Ford offered several different styles of wheel covers. The Ford Crest wheel covers shown here were standard on the Thunderbird. Not only do they cover the majority of the wheel, which is color matched to the body, but they have a brilliant polished finish, a colorful Ford crest in the center, and a circle of embossed wind splits. The base setup was a polished dish with the Ford script that only partially covered the wheel. Some refer to them as dog dish covers, poverty caps, or hub covers. Deluxe wire wheel covers were optional and gave the appearance of a more expensive wire spoke wheel that you typically see on a luxury sports car. The wire covers used the dog dish covers as a base with the wire portion press fitted on top, making it essentially a two-piece wheel cover. Thunderbirds were offered with the option of rear fender shields for a more streamlined look. They featured heavy gauge steel with rubber insulators and bright stainless trim. They're very easy to install and remove for easy rear wheel servicing and cleaning. All Thunderbirds came with 15 by 5 inch steel wheels, wrapped in 6.70 by 15 four ply tires and featured a 56 inch wide track. The tires on this car are from Diamondback Classic Radials. They're fully modern radial tires with a vulcanized white wall similar to what the car would have originally had, plus the period correct pie crust edge. The Thunderbird's brakes were improved for 56 with a new, more efficient design that permitted one point adjustment at each wheel, which eliminated all of the extra adjustment points used in earlier cars for easier maintenance and faster, more economical servicing. The dual servo self-energizing brakes provided excellent uniformity of braking control and performance for their time, especially in hard braking action from higher speeds. Their rugged construction offered longer service life and less lining wear. Their double sealed construction was designed to keep out dirt, water, gravel, and mud. 
The drums span 11 inches in diameter and are composed of steel and cast iron for longevity and faster friction heat dissipation. Manually operated brakes were standard. The parking brake lever is located beneath the dashboard to the left of the steering column. The master cylinder is mounted on the firewall adjacent to the battery. Ford's optional Swift Assure power brake system was touted as reducing pedal effort by a third. It consisted of a compact power unit that was self-contained and sealed, installed in between the master cylinder and the rest of the brake system. Because it was a separate system, if it ever failed for any reason, the braking system would revert back to manual operation. At the time, Ford was the only manufacturer in its field to use five cross members in the production of their frames. All 56 Ford frames had low side rails with kick-ups in the front and rear, along with welded box section side rails. The inner and outer rail channels were continuous welded from the front to 10 inches behind the third cross member and intermittent welded on back to the frame's end for extra strength and torsional rigidity. There were two general frame designs for 1956. The Sunliner, four-door Victoria and Thunderbird, with modification, used a special X-member frame for additional rigidity. The other Ford cars used what was referred to as the K-bar frame. The X-member frame provided extra body mounting brackets and featured a rugged I-beam X-member. The Thunderbird frame had a tubular first cross member, a box section fifth cross member, and box section side rails. The special reinforcements to the inside side rails at the X-member junctures added additional torsional rigidity. The Thunderbird's front suspension was a modified design compared to other Ford cars at the time. It featured upper and lower control arms with ball joints, model-specific coil springs, double-acting shock absorbers, and a stabilizer bar. The rear suspension consists of a longitudinal semi-elliptic leaf springs with variable rates and double-acting shocks. 56 models received longer leaf springs versus the 55s. The ride quality is really smooth and surprisingly well controlled. Of course, there's a fair share of body roll, but we're also not dealing with a late model sports car. It's an awesome cruiser that just floats down the road and stays reasonably planted through corners. Before shooting this video, I wanted to tackle some additional maintenance items that needed to be taken care of. I was able to grab everything I needed from my local O'Reilly Auto Parts, including shock absorbers, new sway bar bushings, and new sway bar end links. I went ahead and did an oil change, too. This car still has its original canister-style oil filter setup, which definitely involves a little more work than today's spin-on filters. You basically have to pull the housing apart, replace some gaskets, clean it all up, and put it back together before installing the new filter element. The whole thing is then threaded into the driver's side of the block. For these older pushrod based engines, especially engines with flat tappet camshafts, it's important to use the right oil that has the appropriate amount of zinc and phosphorus for proper lubrication. Valvoline VR1 has always been my go-to. It's always satisfying to work on this car because of how simple and straightforward it is. For being such an original car, it's amazing how well it hits the road. Ford's symmetrical linkage type steering system includes a cross Lincoln idler arm as well as a worm and double tooth roller type steering gearbox. Master Guide power steering was also available, which reduced steering effort by up to 75% when compared to the standard manual steering system. Hydraulic fluid pressure is built up by a belt driven rotor type pump before being supplied to the power steering cylinder through a ball stud spring loaded control valve that's actuated by the pitman arm. If pressure is ever lost for any reason, conventional manual steering was retained. The overall steering ratio is 23 to 1 and the turning circle is about 36 feet which is certainly more sporty of a setup compared to Ford's full-size cars. That being said, as is typical of cars from this era, the steering doesn't offer much feel, but it's incredibly smooth. 
the assistance is easy enough that most maneuvers can be done with a single finger. This car tracks surprisingly well and is quite stable at higher speeds. It doesn't require as much correction as you might expect and it's fairly predictable. The Thunderbird's three-spoke steering wheel, like Ford's full-size cars, was designed to absorb shocks and protect the driver on impacts through targeted deformation. It was a new feature for 1956. Tests showed that this design did not collapse below the steering column as did the conventional two-spoke wheels used prior. Instead, the spokes soak up the pressure, reducing driver injury and helping protect the driver's chest from more serious contact with the unyielding steering column. At 17 inches in diameter, the Thunderbird steering wheel was an inch smaller in diameter compared to the full-size cars. It was also adjustable telescopically. After pulling a small set screw, the chrome-plated trim on the column can be rotated to loosen it for up to two inches of adjustment. Then, once you've got everything where you're most comfortable, you just tighten the collar, put back the set screw, and you're ready to go. Engine accessibility is of the highest order in designing this car. It's a wide, low, one-piece hood with functional air scoop insert that's front-hinged and spring-counterbalanced. The hood latch release lever is below the instrument panel to the right of the steering column. The hood is also reinforced for extra rigidity. Resilient four-point engine mounting help provide quieter, smoother engine operation. The Thunderbird's mounting was unique. Two engines were available either a 292 cubic inch Y8 that produced 202 horsepower, or a 312 cubic inch Y8 that produced either 215 horsepower or 225 horsepower, depending on what transmission it was paired with. The Y reference refers to the engine's deep skirt cast iron block, which was a trait shared with all of Ford's engines in 56. While a pretty common design nowadays, the deep skirt was originally exclusive to Ford. They claim the design contributed up to 19% smoother performance than shallow block designs. They also claim that the deep skirt block allowed the engines to run as much as 21% quieter. The greater rigidity and higher structural strength that's inherent with this type of engine design helps significantly lengthen its life. The crankcase extends well below the center of the crankshaft, giving greater structural support and better oil pan and crankcase sealing. Cylinder block bolt bosses are entirely separate from the cylinder walls. Head bolts are closely spaced around the cylinder bores to permit the use of solid steel head gaskets for maximum heat transfer. The cylinder heads were designed for uniform distribution of water passages and metal, especially around the intake and exhaust valve guides for more efficient cooling and maximum dimensional stability under the severest operating conditions. Improved manufacturing methods provided a greater flow of the coolant. Both the block and cylinder heads are made from a cast iron alloy. Integral valve guides and seats in the head allow for quicker heat transfer from the valve heads to the engine coolant. Thunderbird Y8s came standard with a Holley 4000 four-barrel carburetor, commonly referred to as the teapot. It offered an integral direct-acting automatic choke for easy starting, a concentric fuel bowl, a low-restriction oil bath air cleaner, and vacuum-operated secondary barrels, that operated based on the engine's needs for better efficiency. For 1956, Ford introduced a new 12-volt electrical system as standard equipment in all models. The higher voltage system allowed the starter motor to provide greater engine cranking speed, particularly in cold weather, and improved the starting ability of Ford's new higher compression engines. An improved generator, while dimensionally the same as before, produced an electrical output that was 61% greater than before. Furthermore, the 12-volt system provided better ignition, especially at higher speeds, and more than ample energy to accommodate all of the various electrically operated available accessories. Ford offered the Thunderbird with two transmissions in 56. 
The standard conventional three-speed manual transmission featured a floor-mounted shift lever and optional overdrive. If equipped, the overdrive essentially offered an extra fourth gear and let the engine laze along at about 30% lower RPMs compared to third gear. This helped improve fuel economy and reduce engine wear over time. Overdrive was engaged by a lockout handle under the dashboard to the right of the steering column. The 292 was paired to the standard manual transmission, while the 215 horsepower 312 was added with the overdrive transmission. The optional Fordomatic transmission offered the widest practical range of gear ratios by combining a torque converter with an automatic gear system. The efficient instantaneous response compared to the manual transmissions gave the car more get up and go, greater passing ability and better overall performance. It was also paired to the more powerful 225 horsepower 312, which made its peak power around 4600 RPM and benefited from a higher 9 to 1 compression ratio. It developed 324 pound-feet of torque at 2600 RPM. Top speed, depending on the transmission ordered, was between 100 and 115 miles per hour. A safety feature was incorporated into the Fordomatic that prevented the car from starting unless the transmission was first placed in neutral. While technically a 3 speed, the Fordomatic is more commonly referred to as the 2 speed because, for the majority of the time, the transmission operates between its intermediate and high gears. Complete hydraulic mechanical operation and control means there's no vacuum or electrical connections. The torque converter was air-cooled, so there's no need for external cooling and plumbing. Placing the gear shift lever in drive permitted maximum acceleration from standing starts or at speeds less than 18 miles per hour, simply by pressing the accelerator pedal down to the floor. Normal starts through intermediate gear can be made simply by pressing the accelerator partly to the floor. You can also manually select low gear by moving the gear shift lever all the way down as long as you're going slow enough to do so. If you accelerate fully from a standstill, the Fordomatic would automatically upshift to intermediate at about 30 miles per hour. It would also automatically shift to intermediate below 30 miles per hour any time the accelerator is released from the wide open position. Automatic shift to direct drive or high is made at speeds up to 65 miles per hour depending on the position of the accelerator pedal. All of these elements of the Fordomatic were engineered for smooth, quiet, and reliable performance such as a simplified hydraulic control system for smoother and easier action, bearings designed for maximum reliability, positive front clutch lubrication for longer life, gears with fine tooth pitch and accurately determined helix angle for quiet operation, and an accordion type rubber shield at the rear of the transmission for protection against the infiltration of dirt and foreign matter. The Fordomatic was paired with a 3.31 rear axle ratio. The gas filler neck is at the back of the car. The door that covers the filler neck is flush with the trunk lid. Tilting the Continental kit out of the way is a must. The total fuel tank capacity is 17 gallons. I've never calculated fuel economy numbers for this car. While running premium fuel for the best performance, fuel economy in general isn't anything to write home about. It's best measured in smiles per gallon. Now let's go ahead and hear she sounds.
The interior of the 56 Thunderbird, while similar to the 55 model, featured refreshed styling and all new interiors, including safety, comfort, and convenience features. It's decorative and posh, with lots of soft touch trim and tons of bright work. Ford offered a ton of ways to personalize all of their models, between colors, materials, and all sorts of fancy optional extras, such as green tinted safety glass to help reduce glare and interior temperatures. There were five new all vinyl interiors available for 56, including red, peacock, black, brown, and green, all of which were contrasted with white accents and inch-wide pressed-in quilted pleats on the doors, cowl panels, and seat inserts. This example has the black and white interior. All hard tops were lined with perforated white vinyl regardless of the interior color. The unique bucket seat appearance of the Thunderbird seat was achieved through a novel application of upholstery materials. In the middle of the seat, you'll find an embossed Ford crest. The seat came standard with manual fore and aft adjusting. This example, however, features the optional four-way powered seat. By using the toggles on the door panels, you can slide the seat back and forth, as well as up and down to accommodate more drivers with ease. That being said, the interior is quite small. I'm 5 foot 10 inches and it's borderline too small for me, but I've gotten used to it. Depending on how tall your legs are, it'll take some special finessing to make it underneath the steering wheel. I have the steering wheel currently set as far in as it'll go. In today's day and age, it's not very comfortable either as the seat cushions are fairly flat, but it's perfectly adequate for cruising around. Power lift windows were available too. If equipped, the driver can control both side windows through a two-toggle master switch. There's also a toggle on the passenger door. Should two toggles be pushed simultaneously, demanding opposite actions for one window, the motor would stop without damage. Just one of the safety features. Manually operated windows were standard. The special Astra Dial control panel with unique inset speedometer curves graciously into the door garnish moldings. Left of the speedometer is a tachometer that's mechanically driven off the distributor. At the right is an electric clock. Across the middle of the dash is a strip of bright metal molding with an engine turn finish that extends over the armrests on each door. An ashtray is integrated into the lower portion of the dash. This car also has a tissue dispenser accessory mounted under the dash. To the left of the steering column is the main headlight switch with an integrated dash panel light dimmer and a knob for the left fresh air vent. The headlight dimmer switch is located on the floor. The ignition starter switch is to the left of the steering column. As far as radios, there were two options for 56 including a standard 6-tube console range radio and a higher fidelity 9-tube signal seek radio. Both radios offered five push buttons that allowed you to set favorite stations. The signal seek radio was pretty unique in that it featured a reversible direct current motor that provided automatic forward and reverse control operation. With its town and country reception buttons, the radio could better pinpoint stations close by or anywhere within the range of reception. A single speaker positioned in the middle of the dash was standard. Ford's Magic Air heating, ventilating, and defrosting system came standard on the Thunderbird. The rectangular shaped control unit in the middle of the dash panel is illuminated at night for easier viewing. The controls include temperature, airflow, and blower fan speed. Air conditioning was not offered on Thunderbirds until 1958 with the introduction of the second generation. The glove box has a locking push button latch and is decorated by an engine insignia in the middle of the metal molding. Wide band chrome molding frames the entire windshield, while the new double swivel type rear view mirror and left side view mirror are chrome plated. This car has an aftermarket set of spotlight mirrors on both doors.
You wouldn't think of something like this having much in terms of safety, but in 55, Ford began pulling out all of the stops with some serious innovating to make their latest generation of cars safer and more structurally sound. Their all-new lifeguard design described all of the standard and optional safety features. The goal was to tackle what was considered to be the big three causes of accident injury at the time. Steering column impact, contact with hard surfaces, and doors becoming unlatched. The lifeguard double grip door latches provided a strong extra door gripper on the striker plate. The extra grip was designed to help prevent the car body and door trim from pulling apart on impact. This greatly reduced the possibility of doors swinging open and occupants being thrown out. Newly optional seat belts helped hold the driver and passenger in the seat in the event of an accident. The box weave nylon rayon fabric is two inches wide and was available in various colors to harmonize with the interior theme. The buckles are made from lightweight aluminum with a non-wedge friction grip for quick one-hand release and adjustment. Additional optional features included a lifeguard rearview mirror and new optional lifeguard sun visors, which were meant to help protect the driver and passenger from injuries caused by striking the rigid structure above the windshield in a crash. The visors are made of shock-resistant padding that gives them a cushioned surface on each side and edge. The other major option equipped on this car is the lifeguard instrument panel padding, which is five times more shock absorbent than foam rubber and gave some extra protection to the passenger. The entire upper dashboard is actually wrapped in stitched vinyl for an added touch of quality. As mentioned earlier, Ford's new lifeguard steering wheel was introduced in 56 as a standard feature on all models. It was specially designed with three spokes and a recessed deep center to absorb strong impact pressures and prevent contact with the steering column. Trunk space for the 56 Thunderbird was improved mainly by relocating the spare tire to the rear bumper. Unlike some other Continental type kits at the time, this was a standard feature for all 56 Thunderbirds. While a cool product of the times, it does add some difficulty when it comes to accessing the trunk. To tilt the tire, there's a lever on the right side that you press down. It's spring-loaded to make unlatching easier. Once it's set back, you can better access the fuel filler door and open the trunk lid. The trunk is 34.8 inches deep, 58.2 inches wide, and 16.1 inches tall. Originally, there would have been a full trunk covering, but the original one that was in this car was badly deteriorated, and I have not yet to put a new one in. You could get a heavy-duty black rubber mat, which is what this car came with, or a houndstooth pattern light vinyl covering. The jacking equipment is tucked in on the left side of the trunk, while the tire changing instructions can be found on the trunk lid. One nice feature I noticed while installing a new fuel system on this car was a small access door in the trunk floor that allows for direct access to the fuel sending unit for easy servicing. Well everyone, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you all enjoyed the in-depth look at the 1956 Ford Thunderbird. Be sure to stay tuned next time and leave a like down below because it really helps the videos a lot. If you haven't subscribed already, consider doing that too, and make sure your notifications are turned on so you don't miss out on the upcoming content. I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.